Hello and welcome to the Mindful Men podcast, the show helping men to open up about manhood. My name is Simon Rennie and my aim is to get men talking. From mental health to fatherhood and everything in between, Mindful Men creates a safe space for conversation. Now, before we get into this episode, I want to say a huge thank you for joining me. It means a world for you to join me and talk about men's issues. And if you love what you hear, please subscribe and share the episode with your mates. You can also join the conversation on Instagram and YouTube, and I'd love to connect with you there. But for now, sit back, relax, and let's get mindful. G'day, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Mindful Men podcast. My name is Simon Rennie, and I'm the man behind Mindful Men. I'm really excited today. I've got Michael Overly from Colorado, USA online today. How are you going, Michael? Oh, I'm going good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, really excited about today's episode because we're going to be talking about man's best friend and how our dogs can help us recover and be well and, and everything in between. So I'm super excited to, to unpack what that is. Um, but to give a bit of an overview, so Michael, you're a canine partnered men's coach. You're the host of the Dogs and Men podcast, which I've had a listen to, and it's really great listening. So anyone out there keen to listen to a new podcast, check it out. Um, and you're an author as well of Let Your Dogs Lead, yeah. Musings on How to Create an Exceptional Life. Wow. What a CV. Yeah, it didn't used to be that cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's the kind of CV we all strive for. So, um, but thanks for joining me today. So Mindful Men podcast, for anybody who's joining us for the first time today, is a show that supports men to open up about pretty much whatever's on their mind, whether it's uh, mental health, physical health, it's healing, it's coaching, uh, work, life, uh, family, whatever it is. And the aim is just to get men talking and, and to show men that it's okay to open up and get vulnerable. So, um, And you've got a great story, Michael, that I'm really looking forward to listening to today. Um, but before we get into that, I'd like to, to throw it over to you and share a bit about your journey and, and who you are and um, you know, where you live and what you do and, and how you came to be where you are today. Oh, my God. We need about 13 hours. Um, <laughs> I, well, you get me started, Simon, and well, I'm off. We could do a 13-hour series. That's okay. <laughs> All right. I'm keen. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So this, this whole part of my journey started about five years ago. Um, when my older brother died, he, he had a bad heart. Um, he had multiple heart surgeries and, um, it was just his time. He went real quick. He actually drove himself to the hospital. Um, tough bastard. And, uh, and then he was gone by the next morning. Um, and he was kind of my hero, right? He had, he had had all these, in my opinion, horrible things happen to him during his life. He was paralyzed at 18, like I said, multiple heart surgeries, learning disabilities, uh, but he was just the, the nicest man I'd ever known. And so he, he was my silent hero. He was, he was silently teaching me how to be a better guy. And I didn't realize it until after he died. And I missed him so much. I grieved him so hard. And that just tore me open. But it turned out to be the most beautiful gift I'd ever received in my life. Because I saw that I didn't like who I was. I didn't like how I was showing up. And what came from that was this wanting to be better. And, and I've just been on this great journey with, you know, with my dogs and, and healing and teaching other men that you don't have to be this, this, you know, this tough guy persona. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely horrible. And you can get out of that and actually be happy. Like most of the time. Well, so, tell us a bit about that time. Like you, you mentioned that you weren't really happy with how you were showing up. Like, tell us a bit, a bit about what you mean by that. Like, how were you showing up in the day-to-day -day life? Oh, yeah, I was, I was a bit of a, I don't know what I can say on this show. <laughs> you can say whatever you want to say. Yeah. Um, I was a dick. Um, I was really nice to a lot of people, but then I had this whole other side of me. I was super reactive, angry. I had this rage boiling underneath the surface, but I, I didn't see it. I couldn't see it. It was just my normal. Um, and I just didn't like how I was treating myself for one and how I was treating others as well. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I wasn't ready to see it. So this, this gave me that gift to say, 
oh wow yeah that's that's not that's not good we need to do something about this yeah were well, you like that like growing up was that something that you'd grown up with during childhood and teenage and early adult adulthood like the way that you were showing up no i i was see here's the thing i was scared most of my life i was afraid so i think as i got older i put on that tough guy persona you know studied martial arts in case i could you know turn into bruce lee and be a real ass kicker i never was um i had plenty of times where you know i got <laughs> i got my lesson taught to me but i wanted people to think i was tough because i was so afraid yeah i wanted people to think i was smart because um i needed somebody else to tell me that i was okay i mean all these identities that i ended up taking on to please others so that they would like me or love me um yeah it was it was not good yeah like why why do you think looking back on life like what was driving that fear do you know or did you ever tune into it as to why it was happening oh yeah um so a number of things from um from my early childhood um you know my my dad wasn't really around let's was, was just put it that way um my mom was a very fearful woman at the time and you know she well she had my sick older brother they had a child that they lost between my brother and I. So mm -hmm. she was just really afraid most of the time. And she kind of passed that on to us. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm not blaming guys, please don't take it that way. Not at all. That's just where she was, mm -hmm. but I absorbed some of that. So I was, I was constantly afraid of whatever else is going on out there. Um, I felt like I didn't even belong in my own family because of what, you know, all the attention that was on my brother. I was, I kind of, you know, felt like I was second fiddle and, that just, you know, rolled on and rolled on and turned into something that I didn't even realize was happening. Yeah. And did that impact like your schooling and then like your work or anything like that? Or do you, was it kind of like, sometimes I, I talk about it as like putting on a mask and the, the internal us is very different to the external us. Like, would you describe that as being like that for you or, or how did it show up in, yeah, in school and work? Yeah, absolutely. So younger years, school, um, not a big deal. Again, I got into my teen years and man, I didn't, I really didn't, I was just so out there. I didn't know who I was. And I, you know, I'm a pretty bright guy. School wasn't difficult as far as the grades, but it was all the new relationships and the expectations and this whole yeah. culture around the school. I was just lost. Um, I barely graduated high school, college. I went back several times never finished um and i started partying and yeah. that got me into trouble too and and so what did you do after after school and, and college wasn't really working out did you get into a job like tell us a bit about your your work career yeah so i i wanted to build things i didn't know what that meant so i was in construction on and off for a lot of years um i also worked in the role of an emt in um you know in, in the mostly in the hospital but in a level one trauma center. And I did that um, and did that in a couple of places, but one place for seven and a half years. And that was huge for me because I, I felt like I was really, I was really helping people. I mean, we saved a lot of people and then obviously you lose some too. Right. So um, it's a little wackier over here. We get a lot of stabbings and gunshots and um, really crazy car accidents, motorcycle accidents, helicopter crashes, those kinds of things. That's where I worked, yeah. but I thrived on that adrenaline because it made me feel important. Right. And that was good. I was really good at what I did. I had a lot of the ER doctors sought me out because I was good. Um, and so that, that attention, that um, recognition was very important to me because I, I didn't, um, I couldn't give it to myself. And I imagine like being in that kind of traumatic environment, would that, did that have any impact on you as well in terms of your mental and well-being or, or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. It, it did. And at the time when I left working there, um, I, my marriage was, you know, falling apart. We also had a pediatric trauma commitment. So that means that any of the really, really bad accidents that happened to kids, they came to us as well. Oh, no. And that really started to affect me. I did. I was not dealing with that well at all. Um, you know, for me, kids and animals getting hurt, that, that's a whole different ballgame. Adults, I had a mindset like, hey, you've had your chance, you know, you, mm. you, you made your decisions. But the, the innocence really started to get to me. Wow. And I had to leave. I, I left my job because I, I wasn't dealing. I didn't realize how bad my marriage was at the time. 
And, and so it was easier for me just to leave my job. Well, and did that Im- help improve your marriage at the time or? It didn't. It, it, it gave me a little bit of relief, but it didn't, it obviously didn't help our situation. Yeah. Yeah. Now you live in Colorado. Have you always lived in Colorado? No, no. Um, I lived in San Diego for about 17 years, Southern California. And I did a little three month stint up in Cairns. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I went over with a girlfriend who uh, broke up with me on the way over there. That was nice. Um, but I'm like, Hey, I got a temporary visa, resident visa. I'm going to go. And I'm, and I had a great time. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about your Cairns trip. Like what'd you get up to? Oh my God. I partied really hard. I met some amazing people from all, you know, obviously from all over people were landing there for, you know, for all the dive trips. Um, actually started in Sydney and we drove all the way up. Nice. So nice. yeah, yeah. I met, I met the most incredible people. I had a blast. Yeah. And I wanted to stay longer, but I, I couldn't get my visa renewed. So you're in Colorado now um, and you're doing canine partnered men's coaching. So tell us a bit about men's coaching and how you work with dogs. I'm, a, I'm assuming you're a dog man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you always been a dog man? Uh, almost all my life. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple periods where I didn't have dog in my life, and man, I got in a lot of trouble. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much time we have for that, but um, I grew up with an, with an amazing dog. Yeah. Um, when when my dad left our family, I was like 11 or 12 years old, and um, I I became suicidal. You know, I didn't try anything, but I had suicidal ideation. And if it wasn't for that dog, his name was Sage. Mm-hmm. wasn't for that damn dog, I wouldn't be here. He was so good at reading my energy and knew what to give me and when. He was fantastic. Yeah. And so that was the premise for this, for this whole thing. I'd forgotten a lot of it until after my brother died. And yeah. I started realizing all the gifts I'd been getting from all these dogs. Wow. And did you have other dogs along the way? Or mm-hmm. you, how many have you got now? Um, I just have one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's a Belgian Shepherd, kind of like a Belgian Malinois. No. Nice. Um, yeah. Oh, oh she's, a, she's a pistol, man. How, how old is she she's about three three oh so still a pup <laughs> yeah oh my god she's and she outsmarts me all the time she's fantastic and what about over the journey have you had like lots of dogs in your life um i've had three other dogs um along the way and the dog i had before her was he was really the catalyst for the work i do his name was darby he's actually on the he's in a picture on the back of my book Mm -hmm. That dog, um, what he gave me while I was grieving my brother's death and what I noticed that he gave to other people just blew me out of the water. Absolutely blew me out of the water. I had, I, I couldn't see all that was available, um, or what we were receiving from these animals until that time. So I want to talk a bit about like, so your brother passed away and I'm sorry to hear that. Um, it obviously sounds like a, a really good role model in your life um and you and you you weren't really happy with how you're showing up so what was it about this point in time that made you think i've got to do something about this Mm. so i i saw what my dog was doing right and i and i realized what he was actually giving me and i thought what how why did i not see this before you know how people have to know about these things they have to you know open their eyes and open their awareness and get to understand what's actually available to them so I started, I tried like three other different dog businesses. Um, cause I thought, well, at first I wanted to focus on the dogs cause I wanted to, I thought that was my way. And I realized later that no, the dogs, they're going to be fine. We need help, right? The humans need help and more so guys. Mm. And I really realized, oh my gosh, one of my best friends, um, his name is Mike also. He's just, he's this super beautiful guy he's this beautiful man he's six foot six he's a he's a giant guy but he's got all this anger and rage trapped inside right now i can see it i can spot it from a mile away and i wanted to help him and so i, I created all this stuff and he may or may or not, you know never get to that point which is fine but i had him in mind i had him i wrote my book like to him mm-hmm. right i had him in mind when i wrote the book um There's just so much. And I wanted to give back to to everybody. I I realized everybody in my life was teaching me a lesson. 
Maybe I wasn't able to see it at the time, but I could see, oh man, I really needed to learn that. And I did the same thing over and over and over and over. Why is this happening to me? Well, because I wasn't learning my lessons. So how did you identify? So you said Darby was, was really pivotal in that moment of, of your grieving process. Mm -hmm. At what point did you identify that he was really helping you to heal as opposed to just being you know, your best mate? Um, almost immediately. Mm. Almost immediately. So I, at one point, I was um, laying back in this chair and I was, I was hurt, like physically in pain and I was just crying my eyes out. I was bawling. Um, and I realized it wasn't just my brother's death. It was all these things that were trying to come out, but I had kept, you know, I'd kept that lid on them. I kept that safe locked up and I just, I had this period where I just, I've, I stopped and he just crawled up and laid on my chest and I felt something I can't even describe. It was, it was, you know, I know it was energy but it was, it was love and energy and compassion. And I was like, Oh my God, why couldn't I get this before? I, I wasn't able to allow it in. And I thought, okay, this, this is, this is amazing. And then I witnessed him and how he worked with other people, my neighbors, my mom. It, yeah. Blew my doors off. So it really sounds like a pivotal moment where two dots connected, essentially you you're going through this grieving process and this this moment with Darby and then what you're starting to see outside. Sometimes it takes a, a grieving process to actually tune into that type of stuff as well. And it, it sounds yeah. wonderful. So like, so why men? Why, why, why your friend in particular? Were you focused on that? Like, tell us a bit about men's culture in, in, in your circles and, and why you think it's important to focus on men. Because we don't ask for help. We may be absolutely miserable. We may drink our lives away. We don't have the ability to ask for help. It's buried in there somewhere, but we've, we've tough guided away. We've drank it away. We've sexed it away. We've done all these other things so that we wouldn't have to show any vulnerability. Um, you know, I'm not sure what it's like down there, but here the society tells us, you know, don't, boys don't cry. Mm -hmm. Don't ever let them see you hurt. If you get hurt, get up off the ground because you're going to get hurt worse. You know, all these things about man up and being tougher and, and you know, eat a steak because you're a man. And we get these crazy messages that, that are absolutely detrimental to our mental health. So men need more help, but, and typically they're not willing to ask for it. So I decided to put myself out there, be super vulnerable, share stuff that I never thought I would. And, and let guys know, hey, it's okay. You know, you don't have to flip 180, but one, if you do one little thing, try it and we go, oh, that wasn't that bad. You know, my mates aren't picking on me. It's okay. It just starts with this one little thing, but we have to have permission. So what I wanted to do, the book I wrote is an invitation mm. to start to look at things a different way, right? It doesn't mean you have to act like I do. You don't have to, you know, behave the same way I do and share as much stuff as I do. But just know that you can do this one little thing and completely change your life forever. It's a wonderful mindset you've got there. And sometimes it takes us a long time to kind of come to this point in life. And, and I was very similar. So I've lived with obsessive compulsive disorder, depression and anxiety for over 30 years. And it took me 20 years to open up. So when I was 28, so I'm 38 now. And when I was 28, so 10 years ago was the first time I went into a doctor's office and said, I think I have mental health issues. It wasn't until my wife basically said, you need to go get help because you're hurting yourself and you're hurting our relationship that I actually did that. And it was the first time I opened up and from there, it's been a gradual process. But I always think back to when I was roughly 10 years old. So I'm in school and I grew up in, a, in Northern suburbs of Adelaide. So that's in South Australia for anyone listening and very working class. I grew up playing football. So Aussie rules footy. I had three brothers, very masculine household. Mm -hmm. And we grew up with that same mantra, boys don't cry. Boys don't show emotions. Boys don't talk about things that uh, are hurting them or anything like that. It's kind of like you said, you know, suck it up, man up. Uh, I always hear the one, drink some concrete, so to toughen up as well. Yeah. And I remember being in school and, and my best mate was, um, he was crying in the, in the yard. And 
And I've been ingrained with all of this in my brain, playing football and growing up in this hyper masculine, uh, or not even a hyper masculine, just a masculine household. And I went up to him, I said, mate, why are you crying? And he said, well, you know, I'm upset. And he, I can't remember why he was upset at the time. I said, mate, you've got to stop crying. And he's like, why? I said, boys don't cry. So even as me as a 10 year old, I'm saying this, this societal conditioning to my mate. And he's like, Simon, I can cry if I want to. It's taken me, you know, a good 20 odd years later to really reflect on that moment. But in that moment, he planted a seed in me that, that told me that everything I'd been learning as a kid and growing up and, and it still kept going, that learning process still kept going into my mid twenties, you know, um, but he ingrained in me that moment that boys can cry, boys can talk, boys can be emotional and it's okay to do those types of things. So I, and it, it's not until I've, you know, gotten to 30, you know, mid thirties and I'm, I'm opening up already through the mindful men podcast and, and, and my Instagram and so forth that you start to reflect on these things and it can take, it can take 30 years to reflect on these things as well and then put those dots together. So I think, I love how you, you put it and, and love what you're doing and, and, and flying the flag for men to be okay to not be okay. So I commend you for it from a, a brother across the blue. Um, well done for that kind of work, mate. Cheers. Now, I want to talk about your book, actually. Um, tell us how the book's been going. Um, how long did it take to write? What were some of the hurdles that you came across in putting it together? Or was it pretty easy to put together? Um, yes and no. <laughs> so I, um, I'd never written a book before. So I started writing it. You know, I, I read a book on how to write a book and um, studied what other people had done. And I was writing this thing and it just felt, eh, it just, it wasn't me at all. And then I, um, there's a coach, he's a famous coach over here that I, that I follow and he can make a point out of one paragraph, right? So mm -hmm. a, a whole chapter can be one paragraph. And I thought, okay, that's powerful. That's bad ass. So that's kind of the style I wrote it in. So sometimes it's a paragraph, sometimes it's four or five pages. Um, but it's just enough to make, have you go, huh? No, I wonder if, no kidding. I want, really? That's all, that's all I want. Right. And then the rest is up to you. So it's creating curiosity, um, realizing that something else is possible. So I had, I'd been big into journaling, right? Mm -hmm. Years ago, I'd been like, ah, only fairies will journal. And I realized, no, this helps. I can actually write stuff down and go, oh, oh man, I didn't know that, that I was still holding on to that or that was still bothering me. Um, and so I, I had like a number of leather journals. And one day I was like, you know, starting the book over and I was, I was kind of upset about it. And then I just kind of looked over and I went, oh shit, there's my book. And so I just started pulling stories, you know, little things out of there and put it all together and yeah, and got it done. So it, it wasn't hard, but it, it took a lot of time because it, there was all these things that I had to get out and I didn't realize they were going to turn into a book. Wonderful. I the reason I ask that is, is exactly what you've just realized. So opening up about things can look very different in different ways. So for some people, it's going to a psychologist or a counselor, mental health, social worker um, as well. Other people, it's writing things down and getting it out of their heads, whether it's a journal yeah. or even a book, um, which is the next, I guess, next level journal, um, if, you, if you can think about it like that. But there's different ways that we get things out for, for guys in particular you know you don't have to go and talk to someone when it can be very challenging for a guy to talk and open up and, yeah. and get vulnerable but writing things down is a great way to to unpack what's happening in our brains and and I, i've used different tools myself i've used the journaling and and trying to, to make sense of it i've also used like there's a there's a process called the morning pages that i love sharing with anybody who, who's interested in journaling and the morning pages is it's a creative process, but it's really good in therapy. So it's essentially like you, you get up in the morning and one of the first things you do, you grab a coffee if you're me, um, and two or three pages, A4 pages or whatever, and you just write all the, the, the stuff that's swirling around in here as it is. So you don't even try to make sense of it. So it could be full sentences. It could be just single words. You write it, you close it. You don't even read it again and you put it on your shelf or you put it in a cupboard or something like that. And you just do that daily. And the idea is it's meant to 
unload or download all the stuff that's going in your head and create creative space so that you can think better, you can plan better during your day. Um, you could go out and be artistic or get into your work or whatever, you know, you just, it just gives you that clarity of mind because you've unpacked all the swirling because a lot of us just get up and go into autopilot. We get on with our day straight away, but we're still thinking about the stuff that happened yesterday or the week before or the year before. And we're not really clear in, in our in the way we do it. So I really love how you were journaling and not many guys do it. It is, it is hard. It can be very hard, particularly if you're still old school and using a pen and paper, my hand cramps, <laughs> cramps up like you wouldn't believe. Uh, so I tend to, to, to do more on typing these days, but journaling, but then writing a book to share that story. That's just an amazing outcome. So well done on that. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. And I love the point you made about it doesn't matter what you do or how you do it, but do something. Yeah. Right. Um, you can get an um, audio recorder mm. and do it that way. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have been to therapy and I, I do have people that I trust that I can talk to now, but I didn't know that. I didn't know I could share some of these deeper things. Um, there's men's groups. Yep. You know, they're even on Zoom. You, you don't have to talk. You can just log in and keep your camera off and stay silent, but listen and go, hey, okay, yeah, this is all right, you know, or whatever it means to you. But something, it has to resonate with you, I think, is an important thing. Um, I like to write now. I love to meditate. Um, and another thing you said about creating space is so big. It is so massively important. I get up at 3.30 in the morning. I do that because I am creating something for myself where I can, I can read, I can listen to a podcast like mm -hmm. yours. I can, you know, listen to an audio book, whatever it is, but I create that time for myself. No one else is allowed except my dog. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not checking emails. I'm not doing any work stuff. I'm not doing any of those other things. That's my time. And I'm creating space for me. I'm creating space here and in my heart to take care of myself. Wow. And, and you've touched on a few things there. Meditation, for one, is not something that guys naturally gravitate towards. So in the last few years, I've been doing a bit of men's yoga. So I found a men's yoga, which is just guys that are like wooden planks. You can't bend or anything like that, just stretching. Um, I've done breath work recently, which was an amazing experience. I just It took me a couple of weeks to get really vulnerable and just let it happen. But it was an amazing release as well. Um, but you touched on counseling or therapy is another process, but writing as well. So there's just yeah. so many different ways that, that we can do self-care. But a lot of us in that, in that macho, masculine community that we, we've grown up in, self-care, as you mentioned earlier, was you know, it's getting on, on the booze or drugs or partying or, or anything like that because it gives us that temporary relief, but it doesn't really give us that long-term relief that we are probably striving for and, and, and searching for as part of our healing journey. Um, yeah. But the only time I'm going to be up at 3.30 is when my kids are up. <laughs> I yeah. do value I mean, my uh, sleep. Uh, well, I don't, I don't have any kids in the house and my mates think I'm crazy. They're like, why? So uh, I said, yeah, it's okay. You don't have to understand. But I, I want to mention one thing real quick. Yeah. Um, meditation, I think so. a lot of people look at that and go, oh, God, yeah, I can't do that. I can't, I can't sit still on a pillow and stare at a candle for 20 or whatever it is. You don't have to. You can step outside, stare at a tree, start counting leaves. That's a meditation. Mm -hmm. All that does is, is it starts to allow some of the, you know, thoughts are still going to come and go, but it allows you to soften your focus on all these other things. You know, you can sit and pet your dog for 10 minutes straight. That's a meditation. Yeah. So yeah, be creative. You don't have to sit in the dark and stare at the wall or, That's right. chant you've actually touched or, on, or whatever it is. You've actually touched on the birth of mindful men. So mindful men. So I'm a just finished my social work degree, about to start a private practice. And I did some of my training in a private practice where I learned about acceptance and commitment therapy. And I loved that therapy process because it's all based on mindfulness and values. And, and I always talk about meditation some people med think it's meditating like on a bed or on a chair and and being quiet but also that moment of going outside even i go for a walk and if i'm not feeling like i'm present like my mind's going in a million different ways i'll often just brush past my hand on a, on a tree or, or something like that or grab some leaves and crunch them in my hand as a 
meditation on the move type thing and mindfulness on the move. And, and that helps to ground me back in the present because, and, and then when I'm grounded in the present, I'm more focused on my kids and my wife and, and my dog, I've got a little cavoodle um, and myself as well. I'm not thinking about all the what ifs and what should have been. I'm just thinking about the here and now, because that's the only point in time that we can have any control over or not even control, just any, any sitting with and, and, and feeling with and being with in that particular moment. So I love that. And you touched on mindful men to its very core. So thank you. Oh, you bet. <laughs> it, it fantastic. Doing that. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it's simple. You know, all, all of these things, these, you know, modalities, methods, practices, they can be simple. Mm. You know, we, we make things complex. Yeah. So it can be the smallest thing. You can take eating an ice cream cone and turn it into a meditation. Just, just enjoy the living shit out of that ice cream. <laughs> pay, <laughs> all, all you got to do is pay attention to the thing running down your hand. And seriously, afterwards go, wow, nothing else was bothering me in that time. Yep. That's it. Anything can be a meditation, guys. So yeah, find something fun. Cool. Yeah. Go, you oh, know. Yeah. I even do it driving. So I've got the kids in the car and, and the wife in the car, but my mind's all over the place. So I'll just be tuning into holding the hands on the steering wheel or actually listening to the, what the kids are saying and joining in the laughter when they crack a joke or something like that is simple. You don't even have to think about, or you, you kind of sometimes have to think about it, but you don't have to take time out of your day to do it. It's just there in the moment. Yeah. And, and it helps us, I guess, I think be more present in that moment. So yeah. awesome. All right, Michael. So now I want to talk a bit about all about canine partner and men's coaching and Tell us a bit about how you use dogs to help men. Like what's the process and how do men get involved? Oh, got it. This is great. This is the best part. So we talked on uh, or touched on, I should say, vulnerability earlier mm -hmm. and the ability to act in a way that you don't let your mates see or maybe even your spouse or your parents or your, your boss and coworkers. So for these guys who have this really deep bond, this tight bond with this animal, they act differently when no one's watching, right? Mm -hmm. They get, oh, good you, good you, you know, all cutesy and lovey and sweet and gentle and soft with these, with these dogs when they think no one can see them. They don't, the, the tough guy thing just goes and disappears, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're feeding them treats from their lips, whatever it is. They would never do that in front, or, you know, usually in front of other people. So that's, that's the point of access. That dog is the key that unlocks that part of the guy's heart where change can happen. So we start there. I, I get deep into, you know, why did you even choose this dog? Why mm. this one dog? What was going on in your life when that dog appeared in your life? You know, why, why do you even want a dog? What are, what are the things that you want from the dog that you can't get yourself? in other relationships. So, you know, we get into all these things and, and just start, you know, just to create awareness. And, and, and it's super important. There's never any shaming. There's never any blaming. It doesn't matter if the guy's a little rough with his dog, that's not my business. Whatever the case is, there's something behind that behavior. So we can get into any of these things, but that dog provides the key to allow us in. So you mentioned like why the guys choose certain dogs so mm -hmm. in in your work with the guys that you have been working with like have you seen any trends of certain types of guys going for certain types of dogs or like what how do you see that kind of connection there yeah i mean it's it's not like you know every gym rat has to get a rottweiler mm. but um there's there's a lot of times there's a fit if you have a guy who's really fit or you know or wants to be a big strong guy there's a reason he chooses a physical trait of an animal um, like they're super fast or they're super, or they're just gigantic. You know, you've got mastiffs. Why'd you want a mastiff? You know, you grew up with a dachshund. Why'd you, why'd you get a mastiff? Um, mm -hmm. So there's always something behind it, even though they don't consciously go, Oh, well, I, you know, I got it because X, Y, and Z like, Oh yeah, they're, they're, they're great. They're big. And they have this, you know, they're big presence and like, Oh, well, why is that important? You know? So you, you, can, you can get under anything if, if someone's willing, but there's always a reason why they were attracted to that dog. There's mm -hmm. an energetic resonance with something about that animal. Yeah, and is yeah. there different types of approaches that you take depending on the type of dog? No, it's usually whatever they're, 
their responses to to whatever it is. I mean, you know, with co- with coaching as in as in therapy, you have you have to follow where it leads you, yeah. and a lot of times you have to work backwards. Yeah. So yeah. And and so how do how do guys even find you? Like how does this how does the word get out that you know that you're doing this kind of work? Um, I'm actually aligned with a lot of therapists, um, and it's interesting. I get a lot of uh, women who contact me primarily. Yeah. Um, because again, guys, guys, they don't want to reach out for help. You know, they, they think it's a sign of weakness when it's exactly the opposite guys. If you reach out to get some assistance with something not going well in your life, that makes you a true badass. That is powerful, right? Mm. Not, not, not this kind of powerful, powerful. So anyway, I, I work uh, with a lot of therapists and I get referrals from therapists. I get referrals from a lot of women that I end up talking to about this because they're like, Oh, how interesting is that? Mm. Um, you know, the podcast is helping a little bit and uh, word of mouth. There's a, t- I'm in a huge dog friendly community. Yeah. So, um, sometimes I'll go to the dog park and just start chatting. <laughs> just chatting dog. <laughs> chatting to dog owners and their dogs. Yeah. And yeah. is it just, do you just do it based in person or do you do things like over Zoom with people across the US or the world? Yeah. Oh, no. I, yeah. Zoom is, has been integral. Um, yeah. It's been hugely helpful. I, I prefer to do it one on one. There's things that I do in person with the guy and his dog out on the trail near the river, whatever that is. Um, but, you, you know, you can do a, a lot of stuff over Zoom with, with guidance. Yeah. And so tell us through like, do you, is it like a one off session or do you work with people on a regular basis, like a weekly or fortnightly or monthly process? Like, what is the, for someone thinking about this kind of work with you, like, what could they kind of expect from you? Yeah, no, I do um, three month and six month coaching. Yeah. Um, I, the only one off is, is a meet and greet. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I give my all, I give you everything I've got in, in that time frame, just so yeah. that whoever I'm, I'm speaking with, whoever's in front of me can, can feel the, the impact of what's actually possible. I, and I don't try to sell you anything. I'm, I don't do that. I just don't do that. It's got to feel right, right? Mm. I'm, I'm, I've said it before, resonance. I am so big into that. If you don't feel something, if you're just left-brained, well, see, that's how much, how much does that come out to per week? And you know, if you're working for a return on investment, then I, I'm not the right guy for you. But if you feel like, holy crap, I had no idea. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point as well is like when we engage with the therapy or with someone like a coach or anything like that, or even just a doctor as guys, like we don't feel, we shouldn't feel like we have to stick with them if it's not working. Like if, if it's not working, there's always somebody else out there that will work. Um, And that's okay. Any, any good therapist, any good coach is okay with, um, you know, guys just saying, Oh, this is not working out for me because that, that connection is really important because if you don't have the connection, you just not, it's just not going to sink in. It's just going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to be you wasting money yeah. and time and, and the coaches or the therapist time as well. So uh, I think it's a great point that you've, you've, you've popped in there that we can ch- chop and change at any time. And, and that's okay as well. It's just part of the journey. Oh, absolutely. And guys, you have choices every day. You've got all kinds of choices to make. And even if you think you're not making a choice, you're, you're making a choice. So you choose to stay where you're at in your life. Once you, once you feel something's off, if you don't do something about it, that's a choice. Yeah. And that's not a shaming thing. It's just an observation. So if you don't like something, choose something different. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it could be, yeah, something different could be a meditation, could be mm-hmm. journaling, could be writing a book. Um, could be medication. That's something that a lot of guys feel oh. a bit of taboo around is taking medication. And I was the same. Absolutely. I think that's what stopped me for a lot of years, even opening up because I didn't want to be taking medication every day. But what I found out is that medication just helps stabilize things for me and for a lot of guys. But that's also a journey as well because I've been on about 10 different types just trying to find the right one that fits for me as yeah. well. So medication is one of them as well. Therapists, um, exercise, diet there's some simple things you can do. Um, you just might need to tweak things along the way and see how, how things progress. But yeah. So tell us a bit about your business. So how can, this is a bit of a chance for you to plug your business and how can people get in contact mm. if they're, they've been listening today and they're interested in, in talking to you a bit further? Yeah. So um, have a listen to my podcast. There's, there's short, there's 10 minute episodes. They're just a little, 
little little hits, right? Just little little uh, invitations to go, huh? Um, I think that's important. Or or look at or read the book if uh, if that interests you at all. Um, mm -hmm. Because what I do again is this: these things are simple but not easy. So um, if there's a resonance there, then reach out to me. You can email me directly. It's michael mm -hmm. at dogsandmen.com. Um, I took my website down because I felt like it actually wasn't serving, right? It actually wasn't serving. So I'm, I'm going to be doing something else. Um, I'm, I'm going to actually start a, a sideline business that raises money to help provide service dogs for guys. Um, so I'm doing something, something that's freaking cool as heck. Yeah, um, so I'm super excited happen. about that. But yeah, you just... If you have questions, you know, listen, 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 read the book um, and email me. Yeah. Um, and I've got a whole bunch of other podcasts I've been on, on a link tree. Um, a couple more questions and I'll let you get, get on with your day is, um, so I'm after some words of advice that you potentially give to a guy who might be struggling and he wants to get help, but he's not really sure how to, he might be a bit scared or he's, he might be mm. feeling a bit of like, oh, I'm not worthy enough to get help. Uh, maybe he's tried different things and they haven't worked. Um, but he has a dog and he's got your phone number. He hasn't quite hit that call button yet, though. What's some of the words of advice that you can maybe give to him to maybe make that call? Oh, ask yourself a question. Um, if I still felt like this a year from now, what would have made it worth it for me to, to pick up the phone or send an email? You that's know, and one. that's and that's just not to me. That's that's to to anyone who, if there's any any wow, I wonder if it doesn't matter who that's with, then that's the direction to start. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. I guess the worst that can happen is you get a no, I can't help you at the moment, or it's a, not a great fit. That's the worst, and you haven't gone backwards. You're mm -hmm. just still at the same space. Yeah. The, well, the good thing that can happen is. It, you could just have this amazing relationship or connection and journey that goes a long way to healing. Um, yeah. It's that, it's that first step, mm. right? Um, there, there's a visual that I love. I, and I don't know who the artist was, but it's two ladders standing side by side. And one has these ladder rungs that are like 10 feet apart. And the guys just stand there going, are you freaking kidding me? And then the other one, the, the rungs are a foot apart. So just take one little step, one little step, because you are worth it. Whoever is hearing this, you, you're worth it, and, and you're loved, and you're actually safe, and mm. people care about you, even if you can't see it or feel it right now. Um, hell, call me. I'll tell you how much I love you. You know, it's, it, That's all available to all of us, but we have, we've got work to do to get there. Yeah, wonderful. I love, well said perfectly said we are all love we are all worthy um and yeah there, there is hope there's always hope you just got to find it buried deep yeah. down somewhere sometimes it's hard to see but um, michael thanks so much for your time today i've really enjoyed this this eye-opening canine focused episode um i'm a dog person so i love talking about dogs and and um, it's great to see you doing this kind of work and what you're thinking about doing in the future with, with you know, getting a, the, the support dogs for men as well, you know, training them up. And that's, that's a wonderful service. So well done on that. Um, but I'd like to leave you here with something that you can plug, something that makes you feel good or that you know that other guys can get some value out of, whether it's a book or a TV show, music that you're listening to, a type of dog that you're thinking oh. about buying or, or owning. <laughs> Um, I guess if, if, you, if you've ever thought about getting a dog, but haven't gotten a dog, let's think about it again. Um, there, there's, I have this whole thing about being of service. Even if you don't get a dog for yourself, is there another way that you could help somebody else? And this, I, I'm sorry we didn't touch on this earlier, but this is such a powerful piece as well. Just going and helping someone else can just trigger something so amazing in you. Um, it's hard to describe. So yeah go who can you help even if it's a neighbor maybe go help them mow their lawn go run, get groceries for the old lady down the street just um just be of service in one little way that'd be fantastic that's awesome and yeah it makes us feel good doesn't it it does well thanks so much again michael i um, really do appreciate your time and I, I look forward to touching base in the future to see how the the support dogs um business is going to go and and how yeah. you're tracking as well and your next book and your next book after that and and yeah, it'd be, it'd be lovely to touch base in the future. Oh, I'd love that. I would love that. Thank you.
Well, that's a wrap for today's episode and I hope you got some value from it. If anything triggered your mental health today, please reach out to your support networks. Also, if you love what you heard, be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your mates. For more from Mindful Men, you can check us out on Instagram and YouTube and I'll throw the links to these pages in the show notes below. But until next time, stay mindful.